Welcome to the Medal of Honor induction ceremony in honor of Staff Sergeant Ronald J. Scherr II. Staff Sergeant was presented our nation's highest and most prestigious award for valor by the President of the United States, the Medal of Honor. This morning, he will formally be inducted into the Pentagon's most sacred place, the Hall of Heroes. Our hosts for today's ceremony are the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Patrick M. Shanahan, the Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Mark T. Esper, the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Mark A. Milley, and the Sergeant Major of the Army, Daniel A. Daly. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the arrival of the official party and remain standing for the singing of our national anthem by Staff Sergeant Adiza Jerbel and the invocation delivered by Chaplain Paul Hurley. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof of the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your presence and your grace that sustains us. Bless this time together as we honor your gifts of selflessness and courage. We ask that you continue to bless us, our nation, our army, with even greater, more abundant acts of love and fortitude so clearly displayed in the actions of Staff Sergeant Ronald Schur. Give each of us the passion to emulate in our lives, the fierce determination displayed in Staff Sergeant Schur as we seek to selflessly serve our soldiers, our families, our country, our world. Lord, I ask you for your blessings to be poured out on Staff Sergeant Schur and his family and on all those who love and support him. Watch over and protect always our soldiers and their families here and abroad. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, General Milley. I want to uh, take a few minutes here uh, to welcome everybody and uh, to recount the actions on the day that we are here to honor uh, Staff Sergeant Schur. And it's an incredible day. It's a great day for the Army. It's a great day for the Schur family. It's a great day for the country uh, to honor such a distinguished person as Ron Schur. Uh, he is, uh, in my opinion, uh, served and the most noble profession, uh, the profession of arms. And then he's continued that selfless service uh, as a member of the United States Secret Service on the presidential uh, protection detail. In both, uh, he has and remains uh, an incredible role model 
of physical and moral courage and, in my view, the epitome of selflessness as a soldier of this great republic. And as we gather here today to recognize his valor and his courage and to tell a bit of his story, we're not here to glorify it. We're here to celebrate Ron Schur so that each of us can aspire to walk in this giant's footsteps. So I'd like to welcome everyone. It's a distinct honor for the Army, a distinct honor for the Department of Defense, a distinct honor for the entire nation. And I uh, welcome DepSec Def Shanahan here. Thank you, sir, and Secretary Asper, and, and many others. <clears throat> but most of all, we want to welcome the teammates and the family of Ron Schur. And with us today are his parents. If I could just have you stand for just a moment for Ron and Fabiola Schur, uh, both veterans of the United States Air Force. Thank you for your service. <clears throat> and not here with us today, uh, but uh, Ron's uh, grandfather uh, served in the United States Navy in World War II. He was on a fast attack carrier in the Pacific and saw action in many of the great naval battles of that incredible war. And his great-grandfather, not with us today, uh, but he served in the artillery uh, in World War I. And this is a, a family of long and distinguished service uh, to our nation. And then most importantly is his wife, Miranda, and his two wonderful sons, Cameron and Tyler. So if I could get you guys to stand up just for a second. And Cameron and Tyler have uh, received coins from pretty much everybody, but they both agree that the coin they received from the Chief of Staff of the Army was the best coin. Uh, it's $2.95 on eBay. If you keep it, it's going to go up in price to pay for college. So don't, don't, the Secretary's coins, Sergeant Major. Hey, look at this. Uh, there's a bunch of other heroes in this crowd here today, uh, in addition to Ron. Uh, and those are the members of ODA 3336, about a third group. Uh, and if I could get each of those members to please stand up for us. This is an incredible group of people, and I'll be describing some of what happened on that day. But as you grow up uh, and you read history books about our country, about this experiment in liberty that we call the United States, you uncover stories of people, people in uniform and people out of uniform who have courage, as the, uh, as the wall says behind me, above and beyond the call of duty. They're stories of ordinary men and women who were tested in the most intense circumstances often against insurmountable odds. And they rise to a level of courage beyond that which anyone would expect of any normal pure person. They answered always above the call of duty, even though every one of them is incredibly humble and was ordinary before that moment. Every one of those Medal of Honor recipients are the most humble people that you will ever meet, and Ron is no different. Every one of them will tell you that their fellow brothers and sisters' arms were just as brave as they were on the day of their action. Well, today we celebrate one of those stories, the story of Staff Sergeant Ron Schur, a living example of all that all of us should aspire to be. His entry into the ranks of our greatest national heroes as a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor is 10 years overdue, frankly. But conspicuous gallantry above and beyond the call of duty of the type that Staff Sergeant Schur displayed, it doesn't fade away. If anything, it shines brighter with the passage of time as we reflect and we study it. So let's step back in time a bit to 2001 when a gallon of gas was a dollar 46 or a postage stamp was 34 cents on the 10th of September. And then the very next day, terrorists attacked the World Trade Center and killed 2,977 Americans, 
in New York City, in a field in Pennsylvania, and here at the Pentagon. Ron had finished his undergraduate degree at Washington State and was pursuing a master's in economics when that day occurred. The brutal attacks awoke something inside Ron. He recognized immediately it was his generation's Pearl Harbor, and he knew instantly that his country was now at war. So in the fall of 2002, Ron left school and enlisted in the United States Army. He was initially assigned as a medic to the 261st Area Support Med Battalion at Fort Bragg, part of 44th Med. He enjoyed his service there, but he wanted something more. So he applied for our nation's most elite force, the United States Army Special Forces, the Green Berets. He excelled in the physical and mental challenges of Special Forces selection and the Q course, and he earned the coveted Green Beret that is earned by so very, very few. He was subsequently assigned to 3rd Special Forces Group, and not long after arrival in 3rd Group, he learned of his upcoming deployment to Afghanistan. And off he went. And then on the morning of the 6th of April, 2008, Ron and his ODA, along with about 100 commandos, boarded CH-47 Chinook helicopters at their base in eastern Afghanistan near Jalalabad, which so many of us in this room know so well. Their mission was to locate and kill or capture a high-value target named Haji Ghaffour, who we've been pursuing for a long time. He was a leader of the Hig terrorist group in northern Nuristan, the followers of Gubadin Hekmatir. He was said to be located in the remote Shock Valley, high in the mountains, at about 10,000 feet altitude near outposts like Wanat and Keating and Korangal, deep in the Hindu Kush. They flew into the valley through low, thick cloud cover where their target was believed to be located and began to unload their helicopters. The helicopters couldn't land on the rough and rocky terrain in the valley, so Ron and his team were forced to jump from the helicopters from about 10 to 15 feet as the helicopters hovered, and they jumped into some light snow below. Once on the valley floor, it was the silence, the quiet, that engulfed them. And Ron and his teammates, along with the commandos, began moving up about 1,000 feet in elevation toward the isolated village where their target was believed to be hiding. The terrain was incredibly challenging, with some of the ascents nearly vertical climbs. Not long after Ron and his team began moving, they began to see people running and moving on the mountain above them. Moments later, over 200 enemy fighters unleashed a coordinated attack with rocket-propelled grenades, machine guns, and rifle fire from multiple directions. Everything just opened up, Ron and his teammates said. One of the Afghan commandos was killed outright, and Ron began treating other casualties. He aided an injured Afghan who had a gunshot wound. He then moved on and treated Sergeant Ryan Wallen, who had been injured by shrapnel from an RPG explosion. After treating Staff Sergeant Wallen, Ron heard there were more wounded further up the mountain. Without hesitation, Ron joined a small team of soldiers fighting their way to the group on the top of the mountain through intense fire as dirt and rocks were kicking up around them from explosions. Upon arriving at the forwardmost position, Ron saw three other wounded soldiers. He treated Staff Sergeant Dylan Bear, who's with us today, who had gunshot wounds to his leg and his hip, and he was quickly bleeding out. Ron enlisted the help of a combat photographer who was with the group, Specialist Michael Carter, to help stop Sergeant Bear's bleeding. But Bear was fading, and fading fast. Bear became calm, seemingly at peace, knowing it was his last moments. But Ron slapped him in the face and said, you're not going to die today. And after stabilizing Staff Sergeant Bear, Ron again moved under intense enemy fire to Staff Sergeant Morales, who's also with us today, who had gunshot wounds through his thigh and his foot, a foot he would eventually lose. Ron bandaged his injuries and ensured the worst of the bleeding was stopped. Then Ron went, ran to one of his team's interpreters, CK. Ron checked on CK, but unfortunately wasn't able to help him. He had been shot in the head with a bullet in the initial salvo and was already killed. Ron moved back to Sergeant Bear and Morales, 
He re-triaged their injuries and did the best he could to protect them from further injury by personally sheltering their bodies with his. The battle raged on and the enemy continued to hit the team and the commandos with grenades and RPGs and small arms fire. More members of Ron's team moved forward to assist with the evacuation of the casualties. Staff Sergeant Walding was among them. As he maneuvered forward, Sergeant Walding was also shot and wounded severely in his lower right leg. Ron was already busy tending to Sergeant Bear, and so he gave instructions to other soldiers nearby to apply a tourniquet to Walding's wound. At about the same time, Ron's team sergeant, Master Sergeant Ford, who's with us today, was leading the fight against the insurgents and coordinating airstrikes and evacuation of casualties off the mountain. As Sergeant Ford directed his team, he was struck in the chest plate by rifle fire, knocking him to the ground. Realizing his plate had stopped the round and he wasn't injured, Sergeant Ford did what every Green Beret does and continued the fight. But moments later, Master Sergeant Ford also became wounded and struck by a bullet round. This time, the round went right through his left arm and then ricocheted off Ron's helmet, who was positioned next to Master Sergeant Ford and wounded Ron in the arm. Ron described the impact of the bullet to his helmet like being hit with a baseball bat square in the head. Although wounded himself now, Ron quickly proceeded to place a tourniquet on Master Sergeant Ford's bleeding arm. During all of this, enemy grenades and friendly airstrikes showered Ron and his team with shrapnel and debris, noise, chaos, dust, and smoke was everywhere. Again, Ron covered his wounded teammates with his own body to keep them from being further injured. Ron and his team knew. They knew they needed help, and they knew they needed to get the wounded off the mountain to a safe location for evacuation. Their initial approach route was in full view of the enemy's defensive positions, so they had to find their way out. Two of Ron's teammates, Sergeant Sanders and Specialist Carter, found an alternate route, but the new route was even steeper than the initial approach. So Ron prepared all of the wounded for movement, and he prov provided improvised tubular nylon webbing in the form of a harness to lower the wounded down the vertical cliff. Ron and his teammates moved casualties down the mountain one by one. Sergeant Morales went first, followed by Staff Sergeant Bear, and then Walden, and then Ford. Once down the hill, Ron rechecked all the soldiers' wounds and ensured they were stable. He continued treatment and prepared the wounded for aerial evacuation. Ron and his team defended the landing zone on the valley floor as all the wounded were loaded while incoming fire continued. A short time later, the remaining soldiers and the Afghan commandos, to include Ron, were extracted. After almost seven consecutive hours of unrelenting fighting, intense combat, the operation concluded an operation that saw 50 close air support runs, 4,570 cannon rounds, nine Hellfire missiles fired, 162 rockets, 12 500-pound bombs were dropped, and one 2,000-pound bomb, and countless small arms and hand grenades and RPGs. There were seven U.S. wounded in action, four that are sitting here today would be dead without Ron Schurer's efforts. And there were 15 others, Afghans, wounded that Ron saved their lives as well. This fight resulted in 10 silver stars, an Air Force Cross, and the Congressional Medal of Honor. That is the most medals awarded in any single firefight since Vietnam. This was a level of intensity that few have ever experienced. And through it all, not a single American soldier or Afghan soldier was left behind. And that is largely due to Ron Schur. It's an incredible story, an incredible example of selflessness, courage, and duty. Ron is not only competent, but he's a man of character, and he's incredibly humble. He doesn't describe himself as a hero. He just says that he happened to be the medic that was there that day. He says his guys trusted him. They trusted him to help 
and he was going to do everything he could not to let them down. Well, Ron, you didn't let them down. You didn't let your team down. You didn't let the Green Berets down. <clears throat> you didn't let your army down, and you didn't let your country down. So today, <clears throat> we honor Staff Sergeant Schur's actions. And although we honor his incredible heroism on a personal level, every single one of his teammates on ODA 3336 of Task Force 33 of the 3rd United States Army Special Forces Group, every one of you is a hero in a very real sense. Every one of you displayed uncommon valor against a superior enemy. You know, at Iwo Jima, the bloodiest battle in American history, it was said that valor, uncommon valor, was a common virtue. And so it was with ODA 3336 in the Shock Valley in April of 2008, where these men before you, every single one of them displayed uncommon valor, and that was a common virtue on this team. And Ron will be the first to tell you that he's wearing this Medal of Honor, not for himself, but for those who are sitting in the row behind him, for his teammates, heroes that he bled with and almost died with. Ron, you are our hero. You're an American hero, and you're a soldier. And everyone in this room is here to say thank you. Thank you for your humility. Thank you for who you are. And you represent all that is good about wearing the uniform of the United States Army in the protection of our way of life. Thank you so much, Army Strong. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Esper. Uh, thank you, General Milley. Uh, well done. What, what an incredible story. Let me begin by welcoming all the distinguished guests who have joined us here today to offer this well-deserved recognition. A special welcome as well uh, to Ron's parents, as we already have done, Ronald and Fabiola. Thank you both for being here. Uh, his wife, Miranda. Miranda, good to see you. And of course, Cameron and Ty Tyler. And you both know that my coin's the best. <laughs> the, one, the ones you're holding right now, so. <laughs> They're worth a whole much more. Uh, I also want to welcome Ron's teammates from the Third Special Forces Group, a, a group of heroes in and of themselves, as the Chief just mentioned who were involved in that incredible battle that day. But today we pay tribute to Ron Shore, whose actions in the Shock Valley of Afghanistan on April 6, 2008, are fully deserving of the nation's highest and most prestigious military decoration awarded for acts of valor. Ron, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be part of this ceremony as we induct you into the Hall of Heroes. Today, Ron joins a select group who have demonstrated the willingness to go well beyond the, demonstrate, uh, well beyond the call of duty, duty when the nation needed them most. We are humbled by your sacrifice and proud to call you an American soldier. When we hear accounts of actions as valorous as those performed by Staff Sergeant Ron Shore, we're often left wondering how, how, how any man can rise to the occasion under such circumstances. Not only did Ron fight his way through intense enemy fire to his wounded comrades, he provided continuous medical aid, despite being injured himself. And when there was no way out other than down a nearly 60-foot cliff, Ron improvised on the spot using nylon webbing to lower his critically wounded teammates to safety. For nearly six hours, six hours, he provided continuous medical aid, saving the lives of everyone under his care. As we step back and examine the man that Ron Schur is, we can start to better understand how he was able to act with such incredible valor on that day. You see, for Ron, selfless service is a way of life. It's a family tradition. Ron's grandfather and great-grandfather 
served. His mother and father both served in the Air Force. Through these examples, Ron developed a deep appreciation and an understanding of what it meant to serve the nation, one that would call him one day. You see, after Ron graduated from high school, he attended college at Washington State University. Upon earning his bachelor's degree, he enrolled in the university's graduate school. And then 9-11 happened. The day before those sudden attacks, Ron was traveling down the path to earning a master's degree in economics. But when the fire and the smoke cleared that tragic, on that tragic day, Ron was left hearing that call, the one that he would soon answer. Watching the country recover from the most devastating attack on our homeland since Pearl Harbor caused Ron to choose a new path. As Ron said, quote, after 9-11, just seeing the stories coming back from overseas, it felt like the right thing to do. So I left halfway through the program and enlisted in the Army. Fully aware that the nation was at war, Ron swore the oath of our Constitution, donned the uniform of a soldier, and prepared to sacrifice for a cause much greater than himself. When he enlisted and selected his specialty, Ron chose to become a combat medic. And shortly after arriving at his first unit, he sought a transfer to the Special Forces. Ron wanted to go where he could make a difference, where the action was, and so he chose to take the harder route. And as an incredibly bright, physically fit, and well-regarded soldier, he was a perfect match for an elite special operations unit. Choosing to become a medic taught Ron how to save lives, and joining the Special Forces would put him into, that, into a position to do just that. He took his training very seriously. He prepared himself technically and mentally for that day when he would have to put his skills to use in combat. For Ron, it wasn't a matter of whether or if, but when, where, and how. Miranda, as, as you recounted so well when describing your husband's preparation, you said, uh, quote, to Ron, it wasn't just about passing the course. It was about needing to know the, know the information because it was going to matter one day. Thankfully for all those on the mountain that day, Ron was as good as they come and as ready as he could be. Resolved to die if necessary, he treated American and Afghan commando casualties one after another amid a hailstorm of bullets and falling debris. Through Ron's incredible heroism and disregard for his own welfare, he saved the lives of his fellow soldiers. Now, the Army at, at all levels strives to produce strong teams. This is essential for success on the battlefield. And to do this, do this, teammates must have absolute trust in one another. It's something we instill in our soldiers from day one. Trust that they are proficient in their duties. Trust that they will always place the mission first. And trust that under extreme adversity, they will be there for each other. On April 6, 2008, the soldiers of the task force operating in the Shock Valley had complete and total trust in Ron Shore. They called for him when the fighting started, and he trusted he would, they would, he would be there for them. As Ron said, quote, I was going to do everything I could not to let them down. And he certainly did not. Ron exemplifies all that is great about our Army and our nation. Cameron and Tyler, your dad's not the type of person to admit it, but he is a true American hero. When the battle broke out, he ran to the sound of the guns. When his comrades were hurt, he provided the medical aid under intense enemy fire. And when it seemed like there was no way out, he found a way. Our nation and our army are strong because in every war, in every generation, men like Ron have raised their right hand and risked their lives to defend the Constitution of the United States. Ordinary men who, under the most chaotic and difficult conditions, displayed extraordinary courage. In the Hall of Heroes, the names of these men are memorialized forever. And Ron, who epitomizes today's greatest generation, joins their ranks. The ranks of those who perform with incredible skill and bravery when their teammates and their country needed them most. Ron, we are honored to have you here with us today and grateful for your service. Your bravery, valor, and courage are an inspiration to us all and to all who will follow. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you have done.
Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Secretary Shanahan. Okay, good morning, everybody. Just keeps coming, doesn't it? Yeah, so uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, family and friends, including every single one of Ron's aunts and uncles together for the first time in 30 years, welcome. And thank you for being here to welcome Staff Sergeant Ronald J. Schur to his rightful place in the Hall of Heroes. I understand some of you even came all the way from Washington State, which is, used to be my home, now I call this home. Ron, you, me, Secretary Mattis, all from Washington State, I like our representation. <laughs> Remember General Milley, quality, not quantity. <laughs> yeah. Red Sox, yeah, we all have our shortcomings. I want to offer a special welcome to Ron's parents, Ronald and Fabiola, as, me as mentioned, both Air Force veterans, his wife, Miranda, and sons, Cameron and Tyler, wonderful, wonderful boys. I had the opportunity to spend some time with the family before uh, this event. Let's take a moment to recognize the sacrifices of the family that they've made for this nation. So I just want to, and special thank you, uh, Miranda, boys. Um, it's all about the family that allows heroes like Ron to be able to perform their duties. To Ron's teammates from the 3rd Special Forces Group, it's an honor to be with you today. Thank you for your service. Let's also take a moment to remember those we have lost, including Ron's close friend and Afghan interpreter CK, for whom he named his youngest son. Today is special because today we take pause to reflect on the solemnness of the military profession and the greatness of those who serve, expanding our awareness and appreciation for the incredible talent and courage of our men and women in uniform and their commitment to each other and to our nation. Today is an opportunity to deepen our understanding of the true meaning of courage, service, and selflessness, and honor the rare people that embody them. There are many valorous stories of combat, but the Medal of Honor is special. It is awarded only to those that knowingly and willingly sacrifice themselves, fully expecting to die to save another's life. The bravest among us the noble and the selfless. Staff Sergeant Schur is one of them. For who can truly understand the selflessness it took for Ron to put his life on the line for the chance to save another's? Fighting up a mountain through the hail of bullets to reach his wounded teammates and their Afghan partners. The honor of a man who heard the call for help and never questioned whether he would answer it the courage of a soldier who ran to the sound of gunfire, refusing to leave his comrades on the mountain, the commitment of a medic whose dedication to his craft and rigorous preparation saved lives when the time we hoped would never come finally did, or the fortitude of a patriot wounded for six hours to protect his wounded teammates before returning to the fight. Up there on that mountain in the heat of battle, Ron exemplified the valor that all men and women in uniform strive for. Where does that selflessness, honor, courage, commitment, and fortitude come from? We often ask ourselves. Ask his wife, Miranda, and she'll answer simply, I wasn't surprised at all. That's just who he is. That is what he signed up for, prepared for, he doesn't look for thrills or challenges, doesn't even like roller coasters. But when the time comes, his sense of responsibility and deep care kicks in for others. That commitment to others and desire to serve a higher purpose has shown throughout his life. As a young man, he was determined to serve his nation. 
Ron attempted to join the Navy SEALs right after college, but an injury from a teenage cycling accident, a beloved hobby he picked up doing triathlons with his father from age 12 disqualified him. But he wouldn't take no for an answer. A few months later, following 9-11 attacks, Ron enlisted in the Army, refusing to stay home while his fellow Americans fought in Afghanistan. In the Army, he chose to be a medic, the person everyone depends on to save their life, and an exceedingly difficult challenge. He dedicated himself to that responsibility, even using his early dates with Miranda to review flashcards and became one of the world's most highly skilled first responders. He continued that rigorous study throughout his deployments, determined to do everything in his power to be prepared when the time came. And when all hell broke loose that day in the Shock Valley, they called for him, and he was there, charging up the mountainside. As Ron revealed to his wife months later, he expected to die but he was determined to do as much as he could for as long as he could. His devotion to them was absolute. After the Army, he continued to serve, joining the Secret Service, another job with duty to protect, to put your life on the line to save another. And at home, he is a devoted father and husband, one who cares deeply and dedicates himself completely. Of course, Ron isn't just dedicated, selfless, and brave, he is also humble. He never wanted recognition. As Miranda puts it, he always wanted to do the coolest stuff, but the coolest stuff that no one is supposed to pay attention to, from the special forces, our quiet professionals, to the Secret Service. From Ron's perspective, he isn't a hero, he just did his job. This award isn't mine, Ron says. There are so many amazing stories out there. I just hope that I can give the Medal of Honor the credit it deserves. For all the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines that are out there missing birthdays and important moments at home because they know how important the mission is. Ron, you are the definition of servant, devoted to your country and to others, a protector, a hero, healer, a hero. And the medal and ribbon you wear reflect the American people's understanding of a certain paradox. We only become truly great when we make ourselves servant of others. Your actions resonate across time and place, inspiring us and fortifying our trust in ourselves, in our humanity, in our military, and our nation. You're a beacon of light in the darkness of war, inspiration for the young men and women who choose to serve, and the reason our nation keeps faith with the men and women fighting to protect it. I'm honored to stand beside you today. Congratulations, and thank you for your service. Our nation is forever indebted to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated during the presentations. The President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3rd, 1863, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Staff Sergeant Ronald J. Schur II, United States Army, for conspicuous gallantry and interpretivity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Staff Sergeant Ronald J. Schur II distinguished himself by acts of gallantry and interpretry above and beyond the call of duty on April 6, 2008, 
while serving as a Senior Medical Sergeant, Special Forces Operation Detachment Alpha 336, Special Operations Task Force 33, in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Staff Sergeant Schur was part of an assault element inserted by helicopter into a location in Afghanistan. As the assault element moved up a near vertical mountain towards its objective, it was engaged by a fierce enemy machine gun, sniper, and rocket-propelled grenade fire. The lead portion of the assault element, which included the group commander, sustained several casualties and became pinned down on the mountainside. Staff Sergeant Schur and the rest of the trailing portion of the assault element were likewise engaged by enemy machine gun, sniper, and rocket-propelled grenade fire. As the attack intensified, Staff Sergeant Schur braved enemy fire to move to an injured soldier and to treat his wounds. Having stabilized the injured soldier, Staff Sergeant Schur then learned on the casualties among the lead element. Staff Sergeant Schur fought his way up the mountainside under intense enemy fire to the lead element's location. Upon reaching the lead element, he treated and stabilized two more soldiers. Finishing those life-saving efforts, Staff Sergeant Sir noticed two additional severely wounded soldiers under intense enemy fire. The bullet that had wounded one of these soldiers had also impacted Staff Sergeant Sir's helmet. With complete disregard for his own life, Staff Sergeant Sir again moved through enemy fire to treat and stabilize one soldier's severely wounded arm. Shortly thereafter, Staff Sergeant Sir continued to brave weathering enemy fire to get to the other soldier's location in order to treat his lower leg which had been almost completely severed by high caliber sniper round. After treating the soldier, Staff Sergeant Sir began to evacuate the wounded, carrying and lowering them down the sheer mountainside. While moving down the mountain, Staff Sergeant Sir used his own body to shield the wounded from enemy fire and debris caused by danger close airstrikes. Reaching the base of the mountain, Staff Sergeant Sir set up a casualty collection point and continued to treat the wounded. With the arrival of the medical evacuation helicopter, Staff Sergeant Schur, again under enemy fire, helped load the wounded into the helicopter. Having ensured the safety of the wounded, Staff Sergeant Schur then regained control of his commando squad and rejoined the fight. He continued to lead his troops and in place security elements until it was time to move to the evacuation landing zone for the helicopter. Staff Sergeant Schur's actions are in keeping with the finest traditions of military service and reflect great credit upon himself Combined Joint Special Operations Task Force Afghanistan, Special Operations Command Central, and the United States Army. At this time, the Medal of Honor flag will be presented to Staff Sergeant Schur. On 23 October 2002, Public Law 107-248, Section 8143, established the Medal of Honor flag to recognize service members who have distinguished themselves by gallantry in action above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor flag commemorates the sacrifice and bloodshed for our freedoms and gives emphasis to the Medal of Honor being the highest award for valor by an individual serving in the armed forces of the United States. The light blue color with the gold fringe bearing 13 white stars are adapted from the Medal of Honor ribbon. Medal of Honor plaque will now be unveiled, inducting Staff Sergeant Schur into the Hall of Heroes.
Thank you, Deputy Secretary Shanahan, Secretary Esper, General Milley, Sergeant Major Daly, and Ms. Schur. Thank you, Staff Sergeant Schur. Distinguished guests, uh, my family and friends, fellow veterans, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and women, uh, Marines. <laughs> Thank you for being with me on this very special day. I'm deeply humbled. Uh, before I get into these prepared remarks, I would like to remind you boys that I gave you a good glow in the dark, counter salt coin, Hopefully, hopefully that still takes priority over any of the other ones. But so, as I said yesterday at the White House, uh, this medal represents the the great work of of the team and all those men who are sitting with me today. We work together as a tight knit family. We trusted one another, and we share a bond that's far greater than words can describe. We're truly brothers, whether we speak every day or not for months or years. At any time we know, we can just pick right up right where we left off and it means a lot. To this day, there's still nothing we wouldn't do for each other. This Medal of Honor is for those who didn't make it in past and present battles, those who are still out there confronting the enemy and building partnerships, and my teammates who persevered on April 6th, 2008. For me, like many others, joining America's fighting force in response to the 9-11 attacks was the right thing to do. It's hard to believe that it's been 17 years since that evil had struck our land. But we stood up together and we made a difference. That is why I joined to try and make a difference. I'm so, the, I'm so proud that my parents, grandfather and great grandfather, had served before me and they taught me the value of service before self. So I was actually born on December 7th. Um, and so growing up, I learned a lot about. Pearl Harbor, probably too much. You guys should have <laughs> done less. <laughs> but never imagining that I would uh, see another direct attack on America. As a man, I couldn't believe what I was watching on TV. I was in graduate school at Washington State University. And like so many others, I was angry watching the attacks on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon and the down plane in Pennsylvania. I could not believe what was happening. It was my duty to join the military to help. And eventually donning the Green Beret and eventually becoming their medic. So before every, before every battle that we were, or mission that we would go out on, um, unfortunately he couldn't be here today, but uh, one, of the, one of the guys with us, Ryan, he would always take his commando squad and he would bring them over to me and he would say, if something happens to me, find Ron. And little did I know that the calls for Ron on April 6, 2008 would come from all around me. The Special Forces Operational Detachment, Alpha 3336, was a strong family overcoming the odds. The ODA was on a mission to capture or kill a high value target in Shock Valley, Afghanistan. For over six hours, we fought together, and it seemed like an eternity. But we never stopped working together. Everyone knew their job and was ready to do it. From the moment we got off the helicopters, we were surrounded by a harsh terrain and a well-prepared enemy who had the stronghold. As we navigated through the valley, insurgent sniper fire, rocket propelled grenades, small arms and machine gun fire forced us into defensive fighting positions. Within the first few moments of the fight, I heard the first calls for help, and I moved to a wounded Afghan commando. 
as I finished helping him, I remember looking over the valley and seeing an RPG land near some of the defending troops, quickly followed by calls for Ron coming down the line. So I knew immediately who, who had been hurt. I didn't have long to help treat uh, Ryan's uh, shrapnel wounds before hearing radio calls that the forward assault element had been pinned down and more casualties needed help. All I remember is we're gonna get to my brothers. I don't remember gunfire, I don't remember obstacles. Over the course of the battle, the casualties continued to mount, both Afghan and American, and I relied on my training, and I tried to focus on one thing at a time, one problem at a time, and work as long as I could. I will always be grateful to have served alongside you guys. It was tough, but I was glad I could be there for you on that day. Two amazing warriors did lose their lives that day. An Afghan commando named Bahadeen, became close blade, um, and one of our interpreters, Edris C.K. Han. They died that day fighting to make the world a better place. We were always close with our interpreters, and we rely on them to accomplish every mission. Two of them are here with us today. Like them, C.K. always dreamed of making it to America, and while there was nothing I could do for him that day, I know that his name lives on. My son Tyler's middle name is Edris to bring a small piece of CK uh, to the States. There's nothing more sacred than family and my brothers from that battle and alongside with them, their, their families that are here today as well. My family gave me great values and for my wife and sons, Cameron, Tyler, Miranda, I love you guys. Your constant support over the years has kept me going. You've given me many home front celebrations with every soccer game, with every t-ball game, with every school event. We always get stronger and better together. This family reunion with our extended military family is a reminder of how strong and resilient we all are when it comes to God and country. I wear this uniform so proudly adorned with a medal of honor for those who didn't make it, for those who are still out there fighting, and especially for the men of ODA 3336. God bless America. Thank you. Thank you, Staff Sergeant Schur. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and join in the singing of the Army song. The words to the Army song can be found in your program. March along, sing a song with the Army free. Count the brave, count the true, who have fought to victory. We're the army and proud of our name. We're the army and proudly proclaim. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might. And the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done, fighting till the battle's won, and the army goes rolling along. And it's high, high, hey, the army's on its way. Count off the cadence loud and strong. For wherever we go, you will always know 
that the army goes rolling along. Ladies and gentlemen, please pause for a moment at your seats to allow the official party, Staff Sergeant Schur and his family to exit the auditorium. Ladies and gentlemen, please continue to remain at your seats until your row has been released. Thank you. This concludes today's ceremony.